also with our partners around the world, uh, and of course, uh, Global Gateway. And actually, that is what we're going to be speaking about uh, this afternoon. Uh, what Global Gateway means in practice, uh, in terms of what it demands of its partners, not just what it demands of its partners, but what it can give to its partners as well. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about its strategic positioning, um, a bit more also about how in practical terms our uh, partners and colleagues can work together to leverage uh, the sustainable investments that Global Gateway does envisage, a triggering of around 300 billion uh, euros, uh, of which um, many, in, in which many of the people here on the stage are intimately already involved and working. So I'm very happy uh, to, uh, to introduce you in a moment. I mean, you may get a little sneak preview if, uh, if our colleagues show you a slide. Um, but before that, I'm also, I want to invite um, our Vice President, uh, Liliana Pavlova, to come and give us some opening words over there. Liliana is the Vice President in charge of many things. Our Vice Presidents work hard at the EIB. They have several portfolios. But today, I think, Liliana, you're speaking particularly in your capacity uh, for EIB Global, where you do oversee uh, the Western Balkans investment framework as well as the um, accession uh, process for, for our partners. <laughs> so many things. So anyway, over to you, and then we'll come back to our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear uh, Good afternoon, Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, friends. Uh, it is really my pleasure and honor also on my behalf and on behalf of the EAB to welcome you to the EAB Forum. It is our second day already and uh, to welcome you to this, I believe, very, very interesting and open uh, panel discussion, which uh, will be focusing on the global gateway. Uh, but let me start first by thanking all the panelists who are joining us today and for being here with us and thank you to all for coming to Luxembourg and attending this, uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, and I think it is even uh, more important uh, uh, that we are now gathering in a, in a very delicate moment. Uh, one year ago the world uh, has been uh, shocked and shaken by the Russians' uh, aggression in Ukraine. Uh, and while uh, the, the global media's attention was focusing on the war, uh, the IPCC issued a stark warning uh, to the global community uh, that our climate change uh, uh, is uh, going faster than our capacity to adapt to it. So we must speed up our investments to cut emissions uh, or we will be facing uh, dramatic uh, consequences. So the window of opportunity is still open, but uh, the global investment gap, uh, gap is still not closing. Uh, and uh, due to uh, the reasons we all know and were subject to previous discussions uh, today and, and yesterday, vulnerable countries across the globe are facing uh, severe food security and economic uh, uh, challenges and issues. And at a time when the global economy is uh, longing for stability to recover and to transform, investors are faced with uh, growing uncertainty. As yesterday, the president of Romania said, the uncertainty is the new certainty. So the world uh, needs a positive investment impulse and, and it needs it now. So to fill the investment gap, to fill the finance gap, we need clarity, transparency, good governance, and appropriate incentives. And we need to join forces in developing the right instruments uh, to address uh, market failures, supporting innovative investments that are on one side economically viable, but they don't receive commercial finance due to perceived risks. And really the risk taking is also the other very important element which we need uh, to consider. We are talking about investments in uh, clean energy, in roads, in bridges that are flood proof, or building, uh, buildings that can withstand extreme heat waves, and very importantly, also earthquakes. This is an important element we should never forget. So in also we need investments to prepare health systems for the pandemics of the future and to adapt uh, the farming uh, to drier conditions. 
investments to equip our workers with uh, the skills that uh, match the jobs of tomorrow, investments in digital infrastructure because the fuel of the new economy is data, uh, and the fate of future generations depends uh, more than ever before on the quality and on the quantity of our investments, of our infrastructure investments, which we are doing today. And this is where the European strategy, the Global Gateway, comes into play. Global Gateway, Europe's offer uh, to a world that needs a massive investments, aiming to mobilize some uh, 300 billions of euro by 27, 150 of which uh, for Africa. So uh, we can say that uh, the size is huge, and this is a size which can make a real difference. For many countries around the world, um, investment options are not only limited, but uh, they all come uh, with a lot of small print and, uh, and at a very high price. Sometimes it is the environment that pays the price. Sometimes it is workers who are stripped of their rights. And sometimes it is national sovereignty that is compromised. No country should be faced with the situation in which the only option to finance its essential infrastructure is uh, to sell out its uh, future. And Global Gateway is about giving countries a choice, a better choice. Um, Global Gateway's investments will be sustainable both in environment and also for our partners' finances. Our investments will put people First, And for this, we always co-design projects with our partners to make sure to deliver lasting benefits also for local communities. And I think this was specifically emphasized, like, for example, the minister from Senegal, who was very much focusing uh, uh, on, this, on this element of this attention. Europe uh, has a clear strategic interest in working together for our common planet, making our neighbors, our partners, more resilient to all shocks, replacing unsustainable dependencies with more balanced interdependencies. And in order to do so, we engage upstream in project cycles, providing technical support, technical advisory needed to fill the huge knowledge gap when it comes to such kind of complex and innovative projects. Uh, on top of providing models allowing for higher risk taking based on uh, the blended finance we could offer. Today, we will uh, announce a new impulse in our joint collaboration with our partners, with IFD and KFW, to scale up uh, and to accelerate our co financing in priority partners, uh, in, in priority sectors with our partners. We are also discussing expanding our partnership with uh, EF, uh, EDFI, and I'm sure we will find new opportunities for cooperation with them. And last but not least, we have signed with the European Commission the guarantee agreement on Ndiki, Investment Windows 4, allowing for more strategic support uh, to our partners and leveraging the private sector, and especially focusing also on Africa. An excellent example, which we will be signing very soon within the, the, the range of the, the panel, is the Dakar, Dakar bus network project, uh, which is a very important priority investment for, for Senegal, and an excellent example of the value added of uh, multiple partners cooperation. Uh, and at EAB, we have taken several important steps last year. Uh, your already well aware, I'm sure. One was, of course, to put climate in everything in what we do, both in mitigation and adaptation. And we have created our new branch called EIB Global, which, uh, which really made, uh, made it happen and possible within one year to achieve amazing results, to increase our local presence, to expand our local presence on the ground and to increase the impact of our activities outside of the European Union. And I believe this is a step particularly important for, for Europe, since uh, we are redesigning the model on how we connect to the world. So Global Gateway Initiative will be really based on the very, very successful Team Europe approach, 
and we are really looking forward to continuing strengthening Europe's partnerships and uh, connectivity globally. And in that regard, our cooperation with the Western Balkans, I believe, is exemplary, and I'm really grateful to the governor of the Central Bank of North uh, Macedonia being present uh, with us today uh, for the excellent cooperation we do have with the country, with the countries of the region. Uh, I should say, I, I should mention another very important example of flagship project under the Global Gateway. This is our investment in Rail Corridor 10 in Serbia, where EIB is a lead financier, providing 1.1 billion euro of investments in support of the development of that project. So this is just one of the many amazing and excellent examples we can have and show in, the, in that region and in other regions. So let me conclude by sharing my strong belief that we can accomplish a lot if we are ambitious, if we work together, and if we can make use of the right tools and instruments that could really make the change. Let us be bold, let, let us act now, and let's be decisive in what we do, and especially focusing on the uh, fight for climate and for environment. I believe that uh, by working together in partnerships like this, we will have seen in a moment, it will really make a real difference. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to hear very, very interesting discussion ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President. <clears throat> Thank you for laying out the scale of the challenge, but also for giving us some cause for optimism, which I hope will increase exponentially as this panel uh, continues. Um, let me just uh, introduce you briefly to everyone here before we uh, get stuck in. Um, Anita uh, Angelovska Bezhoska is the governor of the National Bank of the Republic of North Macedonia. Very nice to have you joining us. Thanks for coming. Um, we're also very happy to have Rodrigo uh, Madrazo, uh, who is the CEO of the Edfi um, management company, Edfi B for those of you who don't know, uh, the European Development Finance Institutions. Um, we have Marcus Berndt, who is uh, the head of EIB Global, who will tell you a bit more about that if you'd like to know. Um, but uh, happy to have you up here with us, Marcus. Very pleased as well uh, to welcome Andre Allert, who is the Director of Strategy and Financial Instruments at KFW. I'm sure all of you know who that is, but just in case you don't, it is the German uh, promotional bank uh, with whom we're going to be signing some agreements. Kuhn Duns, uh, I'm sure is known to all of you, Director General of uh, what we know in the Brussels bubble as INTPA, which stands for the Department for International Partnerships at the European Commission uh, and providing a lot of strategic direction for Global Gateway. And uh, last but in no means uh, least, we have Papa Amadou Saar, who is the Executive Director of Mobilization Partnerships and Communication at uh, IFD Agence Française de Développement. So thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to uh, kick off with you, uh, Kuhn, if I may, and ask you from the European Commission's perspective. You talk about Global Gateway as being a game changer. Um, now, what, in what way can it actually do that? And to what extent do you think Team Europe is actually fit for purpose uh, to, to, uh, to be the prime movers alongside our partners around the world? Good to be here with all of you on the, on the panel. Um, Global Gateway as a game changer, yes, absolutely. It is, it should be. Uh, the starting point and the real premise when, when we, I mean, when we conceived Global Gateway basically a bit more than one year ago, uh, was indeed that we, we needed to change our business model. Um, because uh, we have seen that there are these short-term shocks, I mean, COVID-19, um, the, the Russian war of aggression against, uh, against Ukraine, which multiply uh, the impact that these long-term adjustments, climate change, demography, and so on, already ha have on our, on our partners. And we felt that somehow um, the, the way in which we were operating uh, did not sufficiently offer us uh, a way of really having impact on our partners. And that's, of course, strengthened even more by the geopolitics and the fact that many of our partners are looking at multiple offers that are around. We think that Europe, Team Europe, has a distinct 
uh, offer. And we wanted to capture that distinct offer in a strategic framework. And that's ultimately what Global Gateway is. It starts by focusing on five priority uh, areas, uh, the digital transition, the green transition to, uh, to low carbon, zero carbon, um, transport, uh, infrastructure and connectivity, and then two more soft areas, health and education and, and, uh, and research. And the purpose of Global Gateway is to build an offer from the European side to partners that ultimately focusing on helping them to strengthen their strategic resilience, strategic autonomy, to reduce their strategic dependencies. We felt that there was a need for that because we clearly see how the fragilities that exist in our, let's say, interlinked global community, and of which we've seen a number of cases, are increasingly weaponized or risk being weaponized, and therefore that it's important that as our offer to partners integrates the fact that we want to help them, support them, to build that kind of resilience against those fragilities in notably these uh, five specific areas. The big innovation, I think, or there are a number of big innovations. The first one, I would say, is that there's a hard infrastructure component that is absolutely fundamental. I think that if I look back, I mean, over the past few decades, we've basically, as a let's say as a donor community, largely withdrawn from doing hard infrastructure. It's all been about uh, regulatory frameworks, uh, the soft side of things and so on. We need to move back into the hard infrastructure. Without the hard, we're missing the core. I mean, you can have software, it doesn't mean anything if you don't have the hardware. So we want to build the hardware again and move more substantially into uh, that, that space. But it's not just about the hardware. It's, of course, all the software that comes with it. It's the regulatory frameworks. It's the norms and standards. Uh, it's the skills and the training that are needed. So we want to bring packages that are really complete, 360 degrees. And that's quite a change compared to what we did uh, in, in, uh, in the past. So we're looking for coherence. The second big innovation, uh, and we piloted it under COVID-19, but we're now taking it really to the next stage, is if we really want to deliver that offer with sufficient impact, we need firepower. And that firepower can only come from Team Europe. It can only come from a better alignment between what we, at the EU level with the European budget, uh, are doing, together with what our member states are doing with their bilateral portfolios, what the European development finance institutions are doing, the EIB, the EBRD, KFW, IFD, FMO, and all the others. And so we need that, and, and increasingly, by the way, we are involving also the uh, export credit agencies of our, of, our, um, of our member states. So it's really a total football that we need to play as Team Europe. That's a second big innovation, uh, I would say. And the third one is the very firm geographization of it. Um, in today's world, um, having impact or doing the right thing is one thing, but you also need to be seen as doing the right thing. You need recognition. And that means that the deployment of all of this in a geographic space, notably nationally and regionally, is absolutely critical, so that indeed, as we engage with partners, we can ultimately produce something that is visible, tangible, recognizable. That's all easier said than done. Uh, the return to hard infrastructure with the soft around it, making really Team Europe with the full package of actors work together and then turning this into something that is tangible, visible. I mean, there's a, it's a marathon. It's not something that we can do from today to tomorrow. But if I look back at what we've been doing over the past year, where we are now, and if I look at the, the, I mean, the spirit of Team Europe, I think we're going to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Kun. And, I mean, drawing on uh, a couple of things, just if I may just follow up with you a little bit, Liliana, uh, Vice President, mentioned also that part of this offer, you touched on it too, is the European um, standards, the values that come. Uh, and yet, you know, we're working in an increasingly acute situation, competitive. Um, is this something we can really do, do you think? Well, well I, 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 think, I, think, uh, I think we can, mm. actually. At the end of the day, it's, um, it's for our partners to make the decision on what they want, with whom they want to do it, and so on. But we should never, um, I mean, 
it's not about a competition, but, but we, we cannot be the same as others. We need to be strong at what we believe in. Um, and indeed, at one point in time, choices will have to be made whether, um, I mean, do you want it fast or do you want it to last? We will always remain slower. We will always remain more cumbersome and more demanding. But ultimately, the offer we will bring will be of a higher quality, will be much more sustainable in social terms, in economic and financial terms, in environmental terms, and so on. And that's indeed part, I think, it's not a weakness, it's actually a strength. It's part and parcel of the offer we bring. It brings complexities with it. It brings slowness with it because of the impact assessments, the feasibility studies, and so on. It brings slowness with it because of the complexity. We will not just want to build a road or some hardware. We want to make sure that the whole regulatory environment is fit for purpose, that we invest in the capacity building of the institutions of our partners to handle this. We will want to invest in the skills of, of, of our partners' uh, population so that they can actually benefit from it. So it's a much more complex, but also much more complete and ultimately much more attractive and sustainable package that we want to offer. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. So let me turn to you, um, uh, uh, Rodrigo. From EDFI, I mean, EDFI has at its heart a kind of a way of functioning, a way of working, which seems very attuned to the whole idea of Team Europe. Um, so give us a sense of what that actually means in practice and how much do you think that actually articulates with, uh, with Global Gateway? Um, are, are you basically going to be doing the same thing as you've already been doing or how does it change? How does it uh, take us to a new level? Good afternoon. Uh, let me let me first of all uh, say that I am pleased to be uh, here and thankful to the EIB for the organization of this uh, excellent uh, event. And uh, yes, you are you are right. In EDFI or European Development Finance uh, Institutions, we are quite aligned with the Global Gateway. But if I had to highlight a couple of uh, features of our big family. Uh, I could say, first of all, that uh, it is very relevant. It is, after all, the biggest investor in the private sector outside the European Union. And uh, behind or after this uh, quantitative uh, feature, I could only mention that uh, the Team Europe approach is part of our DNA. Because EDFI is, after all, a big family, a big uh, community made up of different heterogeneous institutions. But they have decided to team up, to cooperate. And that is why they have set up two institutions in Brussels. The EDFI Association, which is the political body representing all the European DFIs, and in addition, the EDFI Management Company, which is the financial arm of this uh, big family. So in the, EDFI, in the EDFI Management Company, we provide financial services and we also manage uh, resources and funds on behalf of third parties, in particular, the European Commission. And that is why, and that is why EU policies become immediately priorities to the EDFI family, to the EDFI Management Company. And even more than priorities, uh, legal mandates, as we, sign countries, uh, as we sign contracts with the European uh, Commission. So regarding, the, regarding uh, Global Gateway, uh, you mentioned uh, before the, the big figure, 300 billion uh, euro, which is, is the mobilization uh, target. But how are we going to mobilize uh, those resources? Are they going to come up out of the blue? Well, I think this is the realm in which uh, EDFI, an EDFI management company, can be helpful. And uh, in order to do so, or in order to explain how, to, how we can be uh, helpful, I have brought with me a little uh, device. I don't know if you know uh, what it is, uh, Shirin. It looks like some sort of cable to me. Yeah, it seems Maybe a cable. Maybe for the back of the television. It seems a cable, I don't know but what your family is doing without it. But uh. or, 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 or maybe a multiple connector cable, <laughs> but this is the EDFI mechanism. The EDFI mechanism. Okay. So let me let me explain. Um, 
When it comes down to guarantees to the EFSD plus, we have on the one end the European Commission. Sorry, Kun, maybe you have not been compared so far to a cable. <laughs> as long as you don't plug it in my ear. <laughs> so, so when you provide resources, when you provide guarantees, in our case to the Edfi management company, they get here this kind of interface and we make those guarantees flow downstream to our network. And this is the important thing here, the network of European DFIs. We have on the other end different institutions. We have FMO, we have uh, DEG, we have Proparco, we have Cofides, we have FinFund, etc. Mm -hmm. And that is why we manage to mobilize resources. So at the end, this FNC uh, network works as a tool to de-risk investment projects and also as a tool to spread the risk of projects. But the good thing about the mechanism is the flexibility. Because I mentioned the EFSD Plus program, but I could mention other, other facilities and other, and other uh, mandates we have. For, for example, in the FE management company, we run for the uh, members of the association and uh, for the EIB and, uh, and also uh, the AFD, the so-called European Financial Partners and the so-called Interact Climate Change uh, Facility. And in this case, the mechanism is different because when one member of the facility identify an investment project, they can share it with the rest of the DFIs. That is to say, this mechanism becomes a risk pooling mechanism. And after all, the very good thing of this mechanism is that we can combine different facilities. If the project is very risky, we can use the guarantees under the risk pooling facility. So it is a real powerful mechanism at the service of the European uh, at the service of the European Commission. Rodrigo, and I'm going to stop you there because I want to I'm going to come back to you. Okay, thank you so much for that. I want to come to KFW. This is very pertinent to, to come back to the point. I mean, we're going to need a scaling up of, uh, of cooperation, aren't we, Andre, um, between ourselves, um, between partners that we haven't seen before, as Kuhn sort of mentioned, and we know the scale of the challenge is huge, not just the targets that we've set ourselves in terms of uh, in terms of the actual money, but getting the projects off the ground. It's one thing getting the money there. Uh, it's actually getting the projects off the ground. So how are we going to do that? I mean, what is, the, what is your perspective from the KFW on this? And maybe you can bring in a little bit uh, a, a perception around this. Uh, tell us a bit about this mutual reliance initiative, which is something that um, I know KFW is working with, AFD, and also EIB. We're going to be signing something uh, in the next... Um, half an hour actually on it. What's your perspective? Yes, thank you very much and also thank you for the invitation. Of course, I'm also very happy to stay here with you to talk about these common issues. And indeed your question was how the energy through the cables are coming to the television screen at the end. Yeah, because something right? like that. But I didn't want to hazard uh, getting myself involved in yeah, it's electrical more or less that. metaphors. Okay, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So, first of all, uh, it's important to say that we as KFW, we welcome the initiatives of Team Europe and Global Gateway. And uh, in my point of view, this is next level of coordination. Next level of coordination. Huh? And these initiatives uh, will help the EU for several things. You named it strategic framework. So, it's a type of uh, setting priorities, right? And it's also helping to give more visibility, of course. And how does MRI, the Mutual Reliance Initiative, contribute to all this? Um, MRI combines three um, financing institutions, the biggest ones in Europe, allowing them to pool resources and to pool also their knowledge. This is the idea of MRI. No? And for what, for which purpose? Exactly for funding large-scale projects, which will be crucial for the success of these initiatives. And when we are talking about a coordinated financing um, based on the principle of reliance, which is very important in this uh, issue, uh, facilitates the implementation projects by minimum three very important aspects. One, the first one, 
is provide a set of rules for the lenders. Yeah? Uh, as you can imagine, the procedures and the rule for all of us, all the lenders are quite complicated and they will be in the future as well. But from our work the last years, uh, we know that yes, it is impossible to harmonize them uh, in a certain manner. The second one is uh, one focal point to the borrower. Uh, we understand that our partner countries very often are quite confused when there are so many players on the table negotiating a new loan, for example. Yeah, that is quite complicated also for our country, partner countries, of course. And the third one is a coordinated approach, not only in the procedure and the rules, but also in the aims, in the governance, in the settings, and also in the results, for example, results measurement. So uh, the main idea of MMI is that the strongest um, financial institution, which means with the most knowledge in a sector or a country or both, take the lead and ease the way to make uh, efficient implementation, let's say. That's the main idea Which of Which was MRI. very much, wasn't it, at the heart of the recommendations when there was this review, this famous review looking into how uh, European development finance worked and financial institutions. One of the criticisms was that there was too much overlap and there wasn't enough strategy. And I guess that's partly why Global Gateway was born as well. But it's also why EIB Global was born. And maybe this is why there is also an upping on this MRI, and today we're going to be signing uh, updated uh, operational guidelines. Is that right? Is that the rationale? This is exactly right, and you, you should understand it as a global gateway in Team Europe initiative as a strategic framework. Mm -hmm. In the MRI, let's say a modus vivendi on the ground of the three, um, uh, of the three um, largest uh, financing institutions of the EU, more or less like this. Mm -hmm. And exactly today we will sign the new operational guidelines. So we made our experiences in the past with about 100 projects under the umbrella of MRI, mm -hmm. which is quite a lot. But yes, there is still some room for improvement. There is still some room for more trust between each other, for example. And therefore, uh, we have worked on the operational guidelines and to do it better in the future. Thank you very much. I mean, staying with this theme of cooperation, trust, uh, building, uh, work together. Um, let me ask you, uh, Papa Amadou from, from AFD, you are uh, really the leading financial institution on finance in common. We, we most recently all gathered in, in Abidjan and uh, important, important things were done there, important discussions were had. But tell us how you feel um, finance in common in particular uh, with uh, the financial institutions working together can leverage private investment um, under the framework of Global Gateway. This is a really hugely important um, issue. We, we, we mentioned earlier that we signed this new agreement uh, for AS, uh, ACP, African Caribbean and Development um, Pacific countries for private sector. How will that work in this area? Thank you. Um, give me one second, please, to commend this work and this sure. uh, forum of the next two days, which has been great and then uh, and my colleagues and I are uh, very happy to be here. And a couple of things uh, before coming to your question is indeed, as Kuhn mentioned it very well, I think I'm really happy to hear that uh, we're coming back to the hard core, the infrastructure, which is really important for development in the developing nations. As you can see with my name, I come from Senegal originally. And what is important as well is the fact that the EU together puts this global gateway. When um, von der Leyen and Vestagen came to Senegal to launch it, I was in the government at that time, uh, the question we asked at that point in time with my president in Senegal is, how different would it be on the field in terms of impact, in terms of financing? Would it be easier to talk to uh, EU nations uh, you know, as a whole compared to separately? different DFIs, different sovereign entities, different et cetera, et cetera. So the way Kuhn framed it 
illustrates very well the way we want to get to for the developing countries themselves that will be recipients of these loans, guarantees, and investments. Because it is a burden sometimes to countries that have to deal with different stakeholders, different financiers. You have to repeat the whole thing together. And it comes to the MRI, Max uh, Andre was talking about later on, because it really simplifies for the ministers of finance and technical ministries at infrastructure, health, uh, sanitation, etc., to deal with uh, three, four, five partners at the same time in terms of procurement, processing, disbursement, implementation, evaluation. Mm -hmm. It's really crucial uh, in, if you want to reach, achieve the development goals over the next few years. Coming back to a question, uh, the AFD, as you say, we host these uh, network called Finance in Common, which has more than 500 uh, public development banks that work together uh, to harmonize, to standardize, to share you know, goals, to share procure, uh, procedures, but most importantly, that they have assets of more than 23 trillion euros or dollars. And leveraging that resources together with public money will make huge impact because for sure, aid alone or loans to government because they have limits in terms of uh, borrowing with IMF standards won't be efficient. So I know Kuhn likes that a lot. Bring in the private sector. For instance, Proparco, uh, when it gets 550 million from EFSD plus, leverage three to four times, it makes four to five billion euros investment in Africa on an average yearly basis. These make huge impact. You bring in private sector, you create window of opportunity, you create the environment framework for investment, and you reach people and you achieve the sustainable development goals at the same time. Last but not least, our objective is to go through uh, financing common EDFI, uh, IDFC, which uh, Remy Ryu, our CEO, is managing as well, to really uh, put together a focus on how to attain the SDGs and make sure that we get the right resources, guarantees, soft loans, loans, also uh, uh, technical assistance, and subsidies to have a common window or common gateway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Marcus, um, as the, the head of uh, EIB Global, I wonder if I can just put you, EIB Global and Global Gateway more or less, um, you know, kind of uh, came into the world um, at a similar time. Um, to what extent do you see um, EIB Global as part of a new approach uh, by the EU towards external partners? Um, and, and what are the priorities, uh, main priorities of the EU, EIB in terms of EIB Global, in terms of leveraging public and private um, sector funding? That's a big question, so I'll ask <laughs> you to answer it briefly. <laughs> I try to be brief, but thanks a lot for the question. Um, I think the main change for external partners, exactly what Kuhn described, is about having a coherent approach of the EU to our partners and be... Uh, be be clear about what our priorities are and clear about what our value proposition is. And we see uh, the formation of EIB Global very much in the overall context of a reform of the EU architecture for development, which was lucky uh, that everything coincided at the same time. We have a new regulation, we have ESD+, we have new options to partner with others. Uh, ETFI has significantly stepped up by, by uh, uh, creating the management company. And, and we have a very clear set uh, of priorities. So our priorities, if you ask us, our priorities are exactly, unsurprisingly, the priorities of the European Union because we're a European Union uh, institution. So it's uh, the Green Deal. Uh, we, we are, uh, a significant part of our work is to support climate and environmental projects. So last year we did uh, almost half of our projects were in support of that objective. And we will contribute to the global objective of the EIB to uh, mobilize one trillion of investments in this area during this decade. The second one, of course, inclusive growth. I think uh, there's a lot of work we do together with the partners in Edfis and others, of course. And then the third one, Global Gateway, which we are discussing today. And there, um, again, it was, uh, it was great to have a start of EIB Global at the time when we launched uh, Global Gateway. We could immediately, as uh, while we were discussing the final, uh, final 
uh, you know, the final wording of, of the communication, uh, go to our board and ask for significant capital allocation to support this uh, initiative. And we're very happy that we have already last year supported um, more than, than six billion of financing, leveraging 30 billion of investments that are at the heart of this initiative. So I think it was important for us to be given the chance to show that Europe is not just talking, but that we're doing and that we're serious about this. Um, obviously, all these three priorities are uh, supported in the context of the various regional strategies that the European Union has in their partnership with different, uh, different regions, Africa, Asia, Latin America, our neighborhood, but also, of course, accession countries. And in that framework of the accession, of course, Ukraine has been an important uh, element of our work uh, last year. But I think it is important to stress that, uh, and I checked <laughs> before coming here, actually, that if we look at where we increased our financing last year, and we had a significant increase, uh, thanks to, in, in particular, uh, Global Gateway, we have increased our financing in every single region. So it's because there's always a suspicion that the European Union now puts all their funding in, into Ukraine and forgets about the rest of the world because that's a European problem. But we have significantly stepped up in Africa, which was half of 47% uh, of what we do, significantly stepped up in Latin America, Asia, and of course, the rest of the neighborhood. I think that's very uh, important. Now, when it comes to to and I think when I say Global Gateway, of course, it's at the heart of these five uh, sectors that, that Kuhn described, energy, transport, health, digital, and education. Uh, but I think it's also important that indeed at, at the heart of this is not only the financing, but the way, uh, the way we provide financing. The, the, the principle, uh, I think Kuhn described it well, there's no point in us trying to be better Chinese or better uh, other partners, right? We, we try to be better Europeans. And there's one thing... Uh, that is very, um, very valuable in our, in our in our value proposition, which is the trustworthiness that we are serious about making sure that we only find things that we jointly think are very beneficial for our partners. Mm -hmm. So every single project is not only financially sustainable, which as a bank should be okay, right? as soon as you get your money back, but we always also check whether it's socially, environmentally, and economically in the whole sense of the word uh, sustainable for our partners and only then uh, we provide and I think increasingly our partners do see that there's some value to financing projects that do create the returns and not only that are not financing white elephants that might make sense for the financing partner but not necessarily for 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 the um, for the, uh, the the place where where that investment takes place now you talked about the transformation. I think there's three points. One is uh, with the creation of EIB Global. One is, of course, as I said, the policy alignment. And there, it's, it, you know, it's not only EIB Global. It's the fact that we have re, uh, you had another look at the entire architecture. I mean, we, we are really trying to, uh, of course, we can always improve, <laughs> can't we? But I think we are very, uh, we are much better now in formulating what the EU priorities are. Uh, how we see our partnerships, and then s all fall behind that that strategy. And that's not only in headquarters, which is important, but very importantly also on the ground. And there we are very happy uh, with uh, that, together with the External Action Service, we were able to put our bankers and engineers inside the uh, delegations to make sure that there is one coherent uh, policy dialogue to which the EIB contributes and which is then influencing what the what EIB Global does. The second thing, is indeed um, about risk taking. I mentioned that uh, I mentioned that we could convince our member states to put a bit more capital into non-EU operations, or significantly more, actually, which does allow us to take uh, to take more risk, but not not necessarily to take a riskier project, but also to catalyze private investment because that's ultimately uh, the source of uh, financing uh, that we need. And of course, today we signed. Uh, the, agree, uh, the guarantee agreement that you mentioned, which will uh, further enable us to, to do much more also going in areas that are even riskier, local currency, equity uh, guarantees, and so on. And then third, uh, the third one is, is indeed partnerships. Uh, we had to, and that's why it's very good to be at this forum, which is about partnerships, and it's been a very busy two days. We had very good discussions uh, uh, with ETWI, where we see how we can take private sector leveraging even further, including to further look at the Global Green Bonds Initiative, which is one important element. Uh, we will have another meeting with AFD. We're signing the MRI. I think it's very important 
uh, that uh, when it comes to EIB Global, we are just, uh, we, I think the other strength of the European Union is not, uh, you know, is being a credible partner, but the other one is that we are a very diverse group of people. That might sound chaotic, but it also offers a lot of opportunities if we put this diversity into a strong team uh, that plays one game and, and, and shoots on one goal, I guess, which is the, the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Governor Anita, you, you've been sitting very patiently, and I, I, I think you're probably the most important person on this panel. I'm not just saying that to flatter you, but in the end, it is about Team Europe building the partnerships uh, with our countries uh, around, around the world, in the neighborhood as well. And so I'd like to sort of ask you a little bit, you know, just to reflect on what you think um, uh, your country and the region as a whole as well, perhaps, uh, needs from, from, from the EU, but, but specifically as well, what you would hope to get um, from uh, Global Gateway. Uh, but perhaps maybe just start with uh, a bit of a sort of um, observation and, and to give us a sense uh, in this room of the kind of challenges, the investment gaps uh, that you see from your perspective as governor of the Central Bank as well of, uh, of uh, North Macedonia. Thanks. Okay, first of all, many thanks for the invitation to be part. I'm really delight delighted to be with all of us and share some thoughts on the challenges that the Western Balkan region faces with. I don't know, probably most of you know well, the Western Balkan region, small economies, transition economies with a income, huge income gap, that is income, uh, its income, it's only about 37% of the EU 15. And this still wide income gap reflects particularly slow convergence process in the last decade, decade following the global financial uh, crisis, which was to, uh, to some extent result of cyclical, but also of structural factors, which is clearly visible if we look potential growth, what is taking place in the region, practically potential growth half broadly. And if we look at the growth accounting framework, it's clear that two factors are affecting this development. TFP, slowdown, and capital accumulation. Practically, capital accumulation coincides with significant deceleration of the investment rates in the region. It was across, across the board, reflecting less favorable external developments, a lower inflows in the region, but also domestic factors, such as slowdown in the structural reforms, lower capacity to borrow, a lower savings rate, and so, and so on. So practically, uh, investment, and even the problem is not just that investment rates have been lower in comparison with the previous decade, let's say, because in some cases it may reflect unsustainably high investments that we faced in the region. But the problem is that these investment rates remain below some uh, fast convergence episodes from, from past. So um, as a consequence, if we look to gay, uh, today, the investment gap or capital gap in the region, it's huge. Capital stock in the region is only about 26% of the EU 15 capital stock. This is uh, relevant for both segments, private and public capital stock. And even if, if we dig into numbers, it's clear that it's more private capital stock that we see wider gap. But the story doesn't finish here. If we dig more into details, because it's not just about the size of the capital, what is even more important is the quality, what kind of capital we are, we are getting. It's clear that we, as a region, are worse off, in particular in um, uh, intellectual property right, investment and research, ICT capital, and so on. And we all know that these segments are critical in providing more dynamic growth of productivity of the economy, accumulation of capital, and thus speeding up the convergence. So practically, I think uh, to get out of this vicious circle of uh, low investments, uh, low potential growth, and very slow convergence in, in the region. We need, in a way, some rebalancing of the growth model, which is present in the region, tilting it more towards the investments, but even more importantly, high quality investments in clearly defined priority areas. And what, what, what would those areas be? Where do you think you'd like to see yes, uh -huh. those going in terms of what kind of transformation could they... I think a very Entailed. good 
good guideline is the EBRD index, which tracks de facto the transition progress across, across the board. Practically, it measures to what extent economies are competitive, well-governed, to what extent they are green, integrated, inclusive, and resilient. Mm -hmm. And I think if you compare the, the scores of the region with the frontiers economy, I mean, huge gap. But even not comparing with them, comparing with our peer economies in Central Europe, for example, there is clearly a huge, uh, huge gap. So um, I think uh, that it's clear uh, in a nutshell, that capital significantly lags behind Europe, that the investment rates that we are seeing currently are not sufficient for rapid catch-up. And the only possible way is accelerating the investments and such initiatives as we are discussing today, I think are of paramount importance to speed the, to increase the potential growth and speed the convergence. So do you, do you see Global Gateway as a clear complement, for example, to what is already there? So the Western Balkan finance, uh, framework, for example? Yes, uh, definitely, uh, no doubt that um, in general, first of all, I think that this, um, this strategy has a potential to significantly help countries and in the region and eliminate the risk de facto of deleveraging, of, uh, de, uh, de, of divergence, sorry. Because what is very important, I mentioned, there has been slow progress in convergence even before this context of crisis upon crisis. So convergence stalled. Mm -hmm. Now we are faced with new crisis, unprecedented types of crisis. And in this environment, uh, the economies need uh, support from international international uh, community. Why? Just a couple of aspects. Domestic savings remain significantly low, significantly lower than advanced Europe. Um, it is lower than actual investment rates. It is lower in comparison some estimated investment benchmarks, which clearly points to a need of having a better access to external finance. Absolutely. And now, in this environment, when we are, you know, practically behind us is environment when we had a low inflation and low interest rates, now we are faced with the most synchronized and more aggressive cycle of tightening, which, of course, comes on top of elevated debt levels. Mm -hmm. Debt levels in the region despite some consolidation efforts in the last couple of years, practically is significantly higher in comparison with the pre-pandemic period. This is equally relevant for the public, but also for the private sector, because we are also aiming for the private sector, especially in a situation when uh, usually so far investments have been driven by public sector. In the Western Balkan region, on average, the investments has been dominantly financed by the public sector, 60 to 70 percent, which is significantly higher in comparison with advanced Europe. And this comes on top when we are faced with really tight fiscal constraints. Absolutely. So from all of this consideration, I think it's more than clear what role can such initiatives play in our region. Thank you so much for that perspective. And I guess, you know, to echo the words of uh, Papa Amadou earlier as well, the, the capacity to speak with uh, one uh, team, you know, one kind of joined up uh, system or set of processes is going to be enormously uh, important going forward. Um, I, I'd like to thank you all very, very much. I'm sorry that we're going to cut short our discussion a little because we're very happy to be able to announce a couple of very good examples um, of actually how we are doing it, not just talking about it. Um, and that, that's always a good thing, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, Governor and, and also um, for our colleagues from EDFI, I, I thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to ask you to take your seats down here and ask uh, instead for... Thank you very much, all of you.
And uh, in your place, I'm going to ask uh, our Vice President, Amboise Fayol. And also, we're very happy to welcome uh, the Minister of Economy from Senegal, uh, Ulimata Sa. We heard you speaking very eloquently in the main hall yesterday. Uh, please do come and join us on the stage uh, for a moment. And I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about uh, what we're going to do in the next five or ten minutes. Um, uh, please sit down, Minister. Thank you so much and welcome. Uh, so we've been talking about the Mutual Reliance Initiative um, and um, uh, Andre Alat from KFW explained why it mattered. We're going to now, um, as the first of two signatures, um, going to uh, update our operational um, guidelines on that. It's essentially a, a statement of commitment uh, to what we're doing together, the three institutions. So um, I'd invite uh, Vice President Fayol and Kunduns to be the witnesses behind the signature. Yes, this is all very formal. Um, but I would invite, and I would invite um, Andre and Marcus uh, and Papa Amadou to come up and do the actual signing. And then we're going to sign uh, the famous Senegal uh, urban transport project that we're very excited about. <laughs> signing, I'm going to come and sit with you so you're not on your own. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Not too much politeness. Somebody go on. Go on. <laughs> They're taking this cooperation far too seriously here. Yeah. Yeah. You have to pay for that. Okay, so just to remind you, this is, of course, an updating of a signature uh, of, a, of, a, of an initiative which was actually established 10 years ago, and it's going to make it even better uh, than it was before, very much um, in keeping with the Team Europe uh, initiative, and uh, we'll have a little photo. There we are. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now, don't go too far away because we're about to uh, we're about to do another signature involving all of you. But before I do that, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll I'll invite you in a moment, Minister, sure. um, Vice President, and uh, Minister of Economy Olimata. Um, I'd like Vice President first to invite you very briefly, just to tell us a little bit about uh, what we're going to do. Um, and uh, and and then um, and then uh, the minister will give us a few words, and then we'll do the signature. So um, this is, of course, the big transport project. So thank you very much, and uh, minister, uh, thank you very much for being uh, being us with us today. Um, it is uh, it is a great project in uh, in Dakar, where basically we are uh, financing a project of. Uh, renovating, increasing, improving the network of, uh, of uh, cleaner, safe, and affordable transport. So this is a big project, uh, 320 million euros together to upgrade the Dakar and the public uh, transport network. Um, EIB finance uh, part of it, uh, but we are also, and that's what we find interesting, uh, joined by other uh, other partners in, in Team Europe, uh, and, uh, and also the support of the European Commission. That is, uh, that is so important uh, for us. It is also a good sign of uh, what, what Kuhn was saying earlier, which is the interest of the global gateway approach. Absolutely. So uh, for all these reasons, uh, we are very pleased to, uh, to, to, to be able to sign this, uh, this operation today. Uh, very complementary to what we have already financed through the bus rapid transit in uh, in, in Dakar and to uh, hopefully uh, soon other uh, other great projects. So we'll you. invite the, the, the minister to say a few words. I'll just remind you, um, in keeping with what we've just been talking about, this is a this is a contract which is supported uh, both by a guarantee and a contribution from the European Commission. Also grants uh, from the German government, in fact, as well, and of course loans from AFD. So it is truly a real good team Europe effort here, and with our partner Senegal. Uh, and it's all about you. Over to you, Minister. You are 100% right. 
Uh, this flagship program, I will call it a flagship initiative of the Global Gateway, ticks all the boxes. Uh, it's um, a very good example of a blended finance on a very structuring project that is greening um, and decarbonizing uh, urban transport, enabling uh, mobility, uh, enabling uh, economic growth, and uh, particularly it's in my DNA, so I will add that there's a gender angle to it uh, with uh, women empowerment, safety, part of a larger program that we call in Senegal Safe Cities. Uh, we are delighted to, um, to sign formally uh, the, the, the initiative together with, with uh, somebody that I know very well, Papa Amadou Sar. He, we have the same surname, we are not from the same family. Because <laughs> people tend to always think that we are really related. We just happen to have the same surname. But he has been a true champion uh, of um, many, many, many important and um, uh, defining initiatives for Senegal. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be here to sign it. Uh, Mr. Ambras Fayol also did not mention, but he also has a very, very strong relationship with Senegal. I think Senegal is really that uh, poster child of a country that is doing well, uh, a beacon of democracy in a, in a very, very, um, in an area that is in turmoil. So any support that we can receive as a, as a country, as a government, to show that there are ways of doing it right um, and to, to bring about change and to, to, to bring about economic growth to our people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. <laughs> Minister, don't go away. We'll let you be the first to sign. Okay. <laughs> so, Minister, we'll, we'll ask you to sign, and I think we're in a normal queue You're now, so queue. <laughs> Vice President. I think, Marcus, you don't need to sign. <laughs> yes. And then I think... Okay, I think we're done. Thank you, everybody. Let's, uh, let's have a photo. Well done. We, we all look forward to getting on those buses in Senegal and trying them out. Thank you so much. Okay, so, uh, right. Oh, oh, there's another one. There's another one in French. Okay. So thank you all of you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks to all our panelists. Thanks to all our partners. Um, have a lovely return home. Thanks so much, uh, and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's great.